Brian Cantrell and Jason Hoffman. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's really weird for both. This is the first time we've ever shared a stage, oddly enough. Well, I mean, on a stage stage in front of people talking about things all the time. Um, it really came about last time I was in London, which was only like three weeks ago. Um, basically, I was out drinking with James. And so... <laughs> It's, it's, it's tougher to see, but that's James the, urinating uh, on a... There's the... the through that's there, him, that's the... That's him urinating on a tree. So we were in East London uh, drinking, 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 drinking. Uh, he's peeing on trees. At some point, I'm actually urinating on a church. Uh, okay, and which you will not do domestically. You will only which, do that wall problem. Exactly, exactly. Um, and uh, at that point, you know, James's bright idea was like, well, you know, you should come speak at Monkey Grot. I was like, yeah, 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 sure, 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 whatever, whatever, whatever. Just don't take a picture of me. Uh, and he's like, well, you should be Brian. And I said, Brian, well, sure, we can be Brian, but do you want me or Brian to talk? No, like, like both of you. And we said, well, I mean, okay, I guess we'll both talk about something. I don't know exactly what we'd talk about. Well, and uh, you were drunk when you agreed to this, and I never agreed to it. I'm just here anyway, as I recall. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And we, and we never, like, we're not even supposed to be on a plane together, technically, I think. No. And so part of, part of what we thought we'd talk about is, is uh, we, we have different jobs, uh, slightly, but we work a lot together. I'm six months older than Brian. Um, he's, he's skinnier, I'm fatter. Uh, he went to school on the East Coast, I went to school on the West Coast. Um, you don't have a PhD, I do. I mean, all, I mean, all, all sorts of things. <laughs> All sorts of things like that. You know, very, very simple things. And, and so, you know, one of the things we thought we'd talk about is that w we do happen to actually have a pretty good working relationship, I, I, I think. I mean, I just let Brian do whatever he wants, and... and it's a very good relationship. <laughs> it's a very good relationship. And so we thought, you know, in startups especially, and, and we're not really, we're not, a, we're not a startup anymore, but we, you know, we were, say, eight years ago. Um, sometimes the difference between a CTO and a VP of engineering is a bit sort of... Furry, furry, fuzzy, blurry, you know, and, and so a lot of that was really, um, you know, what, what are these roles like, uh, how do we sort of work together, and then I think most importantly, what are what we call anti-patterns, like we've all, we've all been around these destructive types of fools. Broken right? people. So, so out of curiosity, who here is now or has been a CTO of a company, small company, whatever? Okay, actually a decent number of you. Um, and how many of you have been, uh, are now or have been a VP of engineering? I would assume fewer of you. But okay, so actually a decent number of you again. Um, so, and uh, hopefully you don't think that this is a waste of your time, um, but for, uh, for the rest of you, I think that, uh, at least for me, before I came in the joint, the distinction between a CTO and a VP of engineering, just, just as Jason says, is very blurry, um, and, or it was to me. And actually... That's because you were at Sun, where they were all worthless. That's, and we, I mean. Right, we, we also had, I believe, 100,000 CTOs a, at Sun. A CTO I, I, was like the retirement plan. The, the, yeah, no, it's true. Um, and the VPs were worthless. So I mean, it's, it, these were two VPs also worthless. Yeah, different expressions of worthlessness that were very difficult to compare. It's on. So well, and um, part, of the, part of that's the Smalley Wardlord style of management. So it is true. It is true. But so I didn't really, in part because I uh, I don't respect authority or didn't respect authority um, coming from growing up in Somalia the way I did. Yeah, he actually doesn't. Um, the, the, I, I didn't really appreciate the distinction. But there is actually a, a very clear distinction. Uh, and I think we want to start by just defining what the roles are. So um, just in, in the spirit of me defining Jason for him, I will define for you what, what I view the, the CTO as. So the CTO, of course, is the chief technical officer. Um, and in a startup, and it'd be interesting to know how many of you who said you were CTOs, how many of you were technical co-founders? My guess is that, yeah, exactly, that, that a lot of you were the technical co-founder. I mean, that's yeah, a yeah, very fair. kind of typical way. Is there a question? Yes. No, no, no just technical co-founder. Are you raising your hand for that? Well, I mean, you asked a question. I'm not polling you. I obviously know that you're the, you're the CTO. All right. Oh, so, well, yeah. In the future. No, all right. The, okay. uh, that's the, um, so the, the, very often the, the, the technical co-founder, and it's, it's up to the CTO to really establish the... <laughs> the, guy, the, the guy that knows where to buy surfers. <laughs> guy goes, buys what? He knows how to use, like, the Dell website. And the, yeah, right. Sells all the laptops when it goes under. Right. Yeah. The guy who's got the PhD. The... the, the <laughs> But the, the, the CTO really needs to establish 
the, the technical vision and the culture for the company. What is the technical culture of the company going to be? I think uh, the, the business culture for a company, I believe, very much emanates from the CEO. And the technical culture for a company very much emanates from the CTO. The CTO will actually make very important cultural decisions that will affect the way the company grows and who the company becomes. And the, in terms of how technical should the CTO be, First and foremost, in my belief, in my, uh, my way of thinking, the CTO must be at least as technical, and maybe no more technical than this, but at least as technical to validate the vision. The vision can't be too far crazy. It needs to be just <laughs> crazy enough. Well, yeah, yeah and, and I think a lot of it's supposed to be, you're supposed to actually make sense of the world, right? And so, you know, when you think around, um, you know, at least in, in my mind, the CTO role is always supposed to be a, bus a business role. I mean, if you wanted to just do an engineering role, you do it. You just sit down and cut code. But you have to be basically the the chief business person responsible for making sure that you don't make technology mistakes. Basically, I mean. And, you, and so the, the CTO, especially the startup, the CTO is going to be cutting a lot of the initial code. If you're the technical co-founder, you're doing a lot of the initial work. But the, the responsibility. A lot of bad code. Oh yeah, you cut code. A lot yeah, of bad code. Very What's that? Bad code. Did you cut code? Bad code. That's horrifying. Oh, yeah. I, 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 don't do that again. That's when our kernel was a bash script. Okay. If you feel the urge to cut, <laughs> you feel the urge to cut code, you call me. Pearl. You call me and I talk you off that roof, okay? Pearl, baby. Uh, There's so much Pearl. Oh, God. Uh, it I'm was. Just, it was like three million lines of Pearl. <laughs> So, but beyond, 200 I think, modules. I, I, have you got some sort of trance over there? Are you okay? I'm so hungover. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond, I think, the, the, the need to, to establish the vision of the company, beyond the need to, to establish the culture, um, once that is established, once the, the, the company begins to get some lift, the CTO really transitions to become a largely outward-facing role. Um, the, once the, the, that company, once the company does have enough left, the CTO's real responsibility sales is... Sales guy. What's that? Sales guy. Sales guy. Analyst. I mean, I wouldn't say Perhaps. that. I think you can say that. I can't say that. You know? Sales, I mean, it's a sales guy. Sales, sales guy. I'm just a fucking sales guy. Just a fucking sales guy, man. And, and so, but the CTO's responsibility becomes to, uh, slightly more nuanced than a sales guy, needs to understand the relationship between the technology and the outside world. How is this actually going to mesh with the outside world? Um, and as the company grows, because that's a very different role than this kind of initial establishment of vision and culture and this initial validation phase of making sure that the vision is actually sane or uh, sane enough to get funding anyway, or sane enough to convince someone else to join you actually. That's, that's actually only as sane as it needs to be. You only need to be sane. Well, like in your case, really fucking crazy. In my case, it doesn't be crazy. Um, I'm just I'm breathing into the mic. But, <laughs> but you're breathing into the mic, it's very creepy. <laughs> Stop. The, um, I would, so as the, well, you're never going drinking with James again, by the way. I want to make it absolutely clear. After all this is done, what the, this is one of the consequences of this. There's no more drinking with James. James really? Because last, last night, night I signed up for the, the Monkey Morocco trip. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> all of Joyant will be presenting at Monkey Morocco. Yeah, I, exactly. You know, I, yeah. Um, so, but as the company grows and expands, that you, because this role is such a dramatic shift from this initial establishment to this really outward-facing sales support kind of role, the, the CTO is going to be at a crossroads. And that crossroads is going to be, you can continue to become this, the, the CTO, or be the CTO, or grow as the CTO, or you can become the VP of engineering. But you really can't in a company that has more than a pretty small number of people do both. And there are different kind of rules of thumb on this. It'd be interesting to know how many of you who are CTOs uh, maintain both roles um, in, through what size. But once you have about 5, 10, 20 employees, by 20 employees, you really need to be splitting these roles out. What he means, I, I, when, yeah, when you start having engineering teams of 30, 40 plus people, it just becomes... It, and, it, it, and because these roles are too much for one person, you actually need to hire a VP of engineering. So what, what's the VP of, of engineering? Uh, well, I mean, my, my whole thing is, is it's, it's, you know, it's um, someone that's got to basically stay home and cook. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, really. <laughs> you know, I, mean, you know I, I, kept it, I kept it warm for you. I, yeah. I, 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 was, I set it out for you. I don't know where the hell you've been. 
I, I, I'm, 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 I'm the one that's out smoking with Japanese. I mean, the, out smoking with the Japanese and peeing on trees with yeah. monk chips. Yes, exactly. I, I mean, you're responsible for actually developing and delivering product. Um, and I think most importantly... AKA reality. You're actually responsible for yeah, reality responsible as opposed to crazy-ass drunken dreams. Uh, and most importantly, from, a, from really a talent point of view, um, you have to be the, the most talented person on the engineering team. Did I mean, you just say I, that again? I, I just I didn't quite hear you over here. The acoustics are a little bad where I am. The most talented uh, person yeah. on the engineering team. Oh, that's nice. Well, that's, 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 nice. Your, that's your exemplar of engineering, right? I mean, this idea that, um, like, I, I, I actually need it so that every single person's basically on the engineering team because they, they want to be Brian when they grow up. Um, Scary or, but true. Yeah, yeah, or, you know, sort of something like that. And then there needs to be some separation so that... You know, uh, it, it's easier to fire them, and 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 that's well, you know what I mean. I mean, that way, that way, it's, you know, it's like you know, it's like a mom and dad. Well, and I, so. I think this is actually, by the way, um, a bit more iconoclastic than it sounds. Um, it is <laughs> amazing how many companies believe that the VP of engineering should not him or herself be an engineer. Uh, and yeah, I'm here yeah, to tell yeah, you, and true. Jason's here to tell you that that's wrong in our esteem. That's actually the wrong way to think about it. Um, and we pretty fervently believe, um, and by the way, the startups that we most respect also fervently believe that the VP of engineering should be an engineer, first and foremost. And by an engineer, it means... And Brian's an engineer. I mean, look, he's wearing courts. Exactly. <laughs> Who but an engineer would wear this? Would wear what I'm wearing now. Um, but it, well, and most importantly... You can hear, can hear him walking in from like... I, <laughs> uh, I cut code. Um, I am, now you need to be very careful about the way you do that because you obviously do have other responsibilities when you're in an executive and leadership position, but, and you don't want to get into a situation where you've got an entire team blocked on you and you're off giving some stupid presentation in we'll some talk, remote as, content as, because as, your as CTO we'll, got hammered with some dude. So. And, 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 and we'll bring, you, bring up the same, you bring up the same sort of things later on where it's, you don't want to be doing things like rewriting all of your people's code and then just sort of, you know be, you know, in your face. The, the, the this right. was shit. You should have done it like this. Let me show you how it's done, son. Right. So you, you need to be very careful about how you exert that leadership, but you do need to be the, the er engineer. You need to be the exemplar. You need to be the engineer that everyone looks up to from a technical perspective. You need to be the one that they want to pull into conversations. And it's incumbent upon you to actually be the person they want to pull into conversations by not being an asshole and by, and by uplifting folks and so on. But this is a real difference. Again, many people do not believe that. And if you go look at VP of engineering, uh, you go look at, at, at job postings for VP of engineering, and you know, where you've got to be an agilista and all these kind of the emphasis on, the, on what is not the actual creation of the artifact and the leadership of the team. So we, we believe fervently that, that you need to be, uh, VP of engineering needs to be an engineer first and foremost. Why do you have that going on? Do you? I, I, I just, the agilista, agilista, that just makes me. That just conjured up a little, yeah. kind of the scrum lord. And so, so it really, so it really comes down to like you know who's who's in responsible for innovation. And Brian, Brian and Ashley think of ourselves, uh, you know, very much as as peers and always having conversations and making sure that, you know, essentially, um, you know, we're sort of doing this, you know, together quite a bit. Um, I'm mainly responsible for you know making sure that uh, the rest of the company understands what we're doing, what the board understands what we're doing. Uh, you know, when we do sort of a big product. Piece. I'm the one that has 40 analyst calls, not Brian, those types of things. Um, and Brian's really responsible for sort of rolling in and saying, this is how we have to sort of put this together to, to sort of perfectly deliver it on time. And that sort of back-to-back -back type mentality, uh, you know, you got my back, you look that way, I'm going to look that way, and we're going to sort of crank away, I think, becomes, you know, a pretty, pretty key part of, of, of doing that, uh, that type of productive relationship, really. Well, I, I think that this is you know, another important point, and I think a bit iconoclastic in terms of where does innovation come in the company. And there's a kind of idea that, oh, your CTO, he's, that's the idea person, and that's kind of this fount of ideas that kind of sprinkle through the organization, and it's incumbent upon the rest of the organization to you know, cook dinner um, or to actually turn these ideas into reality. That's not the case. That's not actually accurate, certainly not in a tech startup. In a tech 
tech startup, ideas, you know, well-functioning tech startup, if you as a CTO have done your job and you've established the right culture with the right vision, if you've done that correctly and you've made the right hire to bring in the right people, innovation should come from everywhere in the organization. Everybody in the organization should feel, in, in, in the technical organization, feel, should feel empowered to innovate. And it's very important that uh, that is pe people, broadly pe recognized. People is where that comes from. I mean, you know, it's not, organizations don't really innovate. Individuals, very sort of, you know, leadership people sort of rarely do that. They actually need all the other people at the company sort of constantly cranking away on those sorts of things. And, and, and it's really incumbent upon the, the CTO and VP of engineering together to, uh, to uplift where that actual innovation is coming from and to work together to figure out. I mean, one of the things that Jason and I do all the time is when we've got a good idea, someone on the team's got a good idea, and floating it by Jason, it, we, we can understand to what degree, I mean, we think this is interesting, and Jason's like, oh, 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 no. oh, oh this one, this, no, they don't want this, and this one's this, and I talked to these guys last week, and they're going to want this, and all these customers are flying through his head. And then I make four slides, and I start pitching it the next day. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's awful. I, I already wrote that and slide. And then, I wonder why it's, then I wonder why it's late next week. It's right. <laughs> you don't commit to schedule. Very important. Um, we actually, I mean, I'm only saying that as a joke because I actually don't do that, but but because the rest of the talk is actually going to be about our bad experiences with CTOs and VPs of engineering. I mean, what what are the, there's an anti-pattern slide, right, for the actual I mean, yeah, 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 for you. But so the, just to, and before you go, or, or not, there we are. Um, so I think that, that when you got, when you do have this innovation that comes up from the organization, the, that's going to come upwards in the organization, and the and together we're going to realize, hey, we as a company have come up with a great idea. It's now incumbent upon us as engineers, VP of engineering and their organization, to actually go turn that into real product. We are reality, right? I am often the voice of reality. Uh, it's incumbent upon the CTO to listen to reality, which he does reasonably well sure. most of the time. That's, that's about as good as that's going to get. Yeah, so when, you know, when, I'm, when I'm not in Aspen or... Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, right. We're not gonna, so. It's all Space Ranger on us. Um, but the, and, and then what the CTO needs to go do is communicate that. Communicate that to the board, communicate that to the customers, communicate that to the rest of the company. Yeah, yeah that makes it pretty good. So, you know, I, um, I got a confession to make. Um, I'm a disaster porn addict. Um, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Um, I actually it feels more comfortable now that I actually said that aloud. Now, actually, I've, I've been told my therapist keeps telling me I just need to. These kind of group sessions can be really. See, I, and me. I'm just a functional alcoholic. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> um, I, I've got an addiction to disaster porn. Um, I'm, I'm the Charlie Sheen of disaster porn. Actually, there's no That's amount true. of disaster porn that can actually satisfy me. I, the, the, That's true. That's true. Um, and so I, for me, and, and maybe this is just how I'm an engineer, um, I, I love failure. And why do I love failure? Because Well, because success is the absence of failure. That's all it is. That's true. Yeah. And success teaches you nothing. Um, failure is very instructive, right? When you look at how things fail, how systems fail, how people fail, um, you, that always has something to teach because you know that the system ultimately failed. Um, whereas when the system succeeded, the company succeeded, the person succeeded, the project succeeded, whatever succeeded, you can succeed for lots of dumbass reasons. You can get lucky. You can, you can succeed by accident. Um, and, and you can, failure is, is more clear cut in terms of the value judgment we can have against. So we, I, I like failure. I love disaster porn. And I think that it's useful to understand, you know, how do CTOs fail? How do VPs of engineering fail? And I, I hope I trust that you've got your own examples that you're thinking of right now. If you don't have your list of like three people in your head, um, then, then you just haven't been in the industry long enough or haven't worked for enough people. Right? There are enough broken people in the world that we've all worked for them. So hopefully we're going to ca capture those people. Uh, and if we don't capture your best friend, the particular VP or CTO that you remember. I'll please, speak up. We'll make please it speak up. Yeah, let's, let's make sure we get, we get them nailed. Because um, we really, uh, you know, we did this whole thing where, you know, we're getting on the plane. And one, Brian's been harassing me for weeks about putting the slides together, right? And it's like getting on the plane, getting on the plane. I'm like, Brian, Brian, don't worry about it. We're just going to go on stage and have a conversation. Yeah, like typical and, CTO answer. And then, we, right. then we get on the plane and next yeah, thing you know. Don't worry about it, baby. It'll be fine. It'll be got, fine. We're fine. Just kind of, he's got so, a yeah, notebook, yeah, notebook out. Around. He's keeping notes. You know, he wants to talk about things, you know. Stupid, stupid reality. Stupid reality. And, and, I, and I think, you know, it's, it's, as it says there at the end, um, you know, when CTOs basically decide that they're not going to be communicators and teachers, there's a problem. 
Um, and when VP of engineering sit around and just sort of manage people rather than just creating useful things, that's fundamentally where the problems pop up. So when we see failure modes, and we're going to go through a couple of these, this is what we see as the failure modes. Um, so these are the kind of anti-patterns we see. You want to go to the, and I think that um, I'm going to present the, uh, the CTO anti-patterns, and Jason will present the VP of engineering anti-patterns. Um, so w welcome the critic. Welcome the critic. The odds of survival are 655 million to one. Shut the fuck up. I don't actually <laughs> care. Um, the, so uh, when you are trying to build something as an engineer, um, it is critically, critically important that the CTO... You're supposed to be building something that's impossible. The, the, the CTO or who, who, who doesn't actually have that ownership needs to support you and, and can't actually criticize you from the wings. I wouldn't have done it that way. I, t I actually, oh, I told you not to do it that way. It's like, no, no, you never told me not to do it that way. You actually told me not to do it every single way. So when we ultimately, when this yeah. thing failed, you could cover your ass by telling me not to do it that way. That See, doesn't I, actually I, count. I just, I just don't think we should be in this business. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it, it's, you know, I don't need to hear, no engineer needs to hear that you're doomed from your CTO. You want your CTO to be, to, to be defending you, to be building you up, because the, the CTO ultimately... A little more crazy. The, 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 the CTO is ultimately not in the cold sweat of a product or a service that's not functioning correctly, or, that, or where you've got a defect in production or a customer that's, that's upset. That's true. There actually are funny things where I sort of... I walk in, it's like, hey, you know, how's it going? It's like, bad, and, get out of here. And there thank you me. are sweating, and I'm like, wow, you know. Um, Boy, everyone's really high strung in here. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. This, this is, this, I'm leaving, this looks all yeah, messed right. up. <laughs> right, and so the, 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 the critic is a real problem. And if you're going to be a CTO, you need to know that your criticisms are incredibly corrosive to an organization. And, uh, and it's worse when you're also the, one of the founders of the company, because then it's, you know, people, you sit around and you say something and some people just don't ever push back and, you know, heaven forbid you, you say something that's the opposite of what you think to see if someone pushes back, you know, it gets, it gets bad. Right. But I did what you wanted me to do. No, I was actually just, I was just, I, 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 no, I was just saying, I was actually just drunk with James. I don't even, yeah, I was trying, trying to remember actually. I was trying to figure out whether you're an idiot or not. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so it, it, it's, it's very important in, in your organizations that you, uh, that you understand that, it, that it, it, you don't have the right to, to criticize them. And not, not so you can't comment and, and, and help, but it needs to be very positive and uplifting the way you do that. And it needs to be very supportive the way you do that. It can't be a constant pessimist. I, th I think that's what you're saying. Um, we see a, we, we figure we might as well put a picture of your queen up, up, up. Uh, the process queen, the whole, uh, you know, hey, where are we going? You know, what are we, what are we doing with sort of customer problem X right now? What ticket number is that? Uh, I don't know what ticket number is. Does it have a ticket? Is there a ticket in JIRA? No, it's not a ticket in JIRA. Well, then uh, we can't have this conversation. <laughs> you know, that, that's the, you have that, that whole sort of thing. Uh, and it's like, well, okay. Okay, let's go ticket it. Or, or the other fun one, the other fun one is, you know, having these types of things where it's like, it's like, what's this two hour meeting every morning? Well, that's our scrum. We're being agile. We're meeting two hours every morning to be agile. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we have our bi-weekly wait, Friday, wait, on, no, Friday no, off sites. No, no, I'm, oh, wait a minute. Are you a chicken or are you a pig? I'm sorry. I need to understand what you're... We can't just like burst into discussing this meeting. We're being yeah. agile. You must be a chicken yeah. or a pig. That's right. That's agile right. rigidly defines your role. That's if, what makes it agile. Not, if it's not on a post-it note in the wall, we're not writing it. I'm sorry. I only sprint. I can only... It's like... Yeah. It's, and actually, this is the, the, the... I would say the number one <laughs> failing of those people looking for a VP of engineering. I can't tell you the number of people that have come up to me who don't have a VP of engineering. They've got a startup that, that they... Are you fearlessly CEO. agile? They, 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 they've got a, 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 a CTO and they're beginning to elbow up and they say, hey, you know, just so you know, we're looking for a VP of engineering. Really want someone who really understands process. These guys really need some process and I want to have some process, bring some process in yeah, here. Process. CTO, so, hey, you yeah. know what? Funny story. Process doesn't write software, actually. Sure. Yeah, and actually process and it's very important that when you, when you introduce process to an organization, that process needs to be process that uplifts your best engineers. Your best engineers should be enthusiastically welcoming and think, oh, thank God, finally someone is actually instituting you know, a rule that we all broadly agree on. You mean like process is supposed to 
cause less work. It, the process is supposed to cause less work and a higher quality product, and it should be mm -hmm. obvious to everyone that's the case. And yep. adopting things like Agile for its own sake or becoming a, a fascist about Agile, that, that is not actually process. You, you're, you're not exactly. trying to hire an engineer when you're, when you're looking for that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so a, another CTO <laughs> into pattern. Um, <laughs> the, this is the, the control freak. Hey, hey, uh, hey, 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 hey. Do, what? do you mind? I mean, can I say this one? We, I, okay, so you should know that Jason, <laughs> J, Jason is really proud of this particular internet image. And I'm like, Jason, like, what, what does this mean? Like, am I the dog? We're both dogs? I don't we're get both it. Dogs. Like, are, we're both, both dogs. We're both dogs. On the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Yeah. <laughs> <She's>, <laughs> All right, so I guess I mean, I'm obviously the dog on the right in this one. But I guess you're, yeah, you're I, saying I, you're I, not suppose, the dog. No, no, no. But then, like, I'm a dog, no, like, are you standing by the end? See, that, that's, you're being massively too anal. The whole point of this is that neither one of us are the dogs in this picture. Wait, wait a minute, is, are you saying this is a metaphor? For someone else. <laughs> got it, right. Who's doing something wrong. Get it? Yeah, got it. This so, the, a, I mean, yeah. the, the, and the wrong thing here, of course, is that as a CTO, you need to not be a control freak. You've got to understand that you've established the vision, you've established the culture, you have brought in the VP of engineering who's brought in the team, and now it is your job to actually go outward, and it, you don't actually own the delivery of the product, and they are gonna make some decisions that some of those are gonna be good decisions, some of them are gonna be bad decisions, mm -hmm. and you can weigh the, in casually the, if you wish. Well, you the trade-off is that when, you, when it all gets messed up and the, the, you're the one that comes in with the hatchet. Ugh. We say you are, you, this, you in this case? You oh, I'm just saying when you give up control, that when you give up control, you know, the real trade-off is then someone else can basically fuck up and then you can come and just, ah, you're no, fired! Note to self, don't fuck up apparently. You're fired! They, 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 okay, <laughs> Jason has got a hatchet he's been sitting on. Um, so, but very important to understand the, the trade-off you're making. When you are becoming a CTO, you are giving this up. You're giving up the right to hold the leash in your teeth of another dog. Yeah, that, that's actually true. All right, next slide then. <laughs> Used with permission, I have to say, of the uh, Fox Broadcasting Corp. No, no, so you, the thing is, is honestly, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to give up control a little bit here. The, the no-op is one you're very passionate about. I am very passionate about. You're okay. actually very passionate, because you, you, you have, you, you've, I mean, let's, let's take a moment here. I mean, you've been abused by the no-op before. I've been abused. I have been abused by the no-op. So well, tell us, tell anyone us who's worked for a large corporation has been abused by the no-op. No-op, of course, is a, I, I guess we are going to get some assembly in this slide after all. No-op, no operation, right, in assembly. Um, but we, at Sun, we used to call management, or specific managers, but basically broadly management, no-ops. Um, because they didn't do anything. Um, and this was true, I think, and, this is, and Sun did not have a monopoly on incompetent middle management. Um, I have not seen large enterprises in which, and I'm sorry if I'm offending you right now, and maybe you're the exception to this, he's middle management. Actually, he's not actually sorry. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sorry at all. I'm just saying that. It's, I understand that it's like a social cue where I need to say that, but I'm actually not apologetic whatsoever. Middle management, in my experience, it's very hard for middle management to add value. Now, it can, but one variant of middle management that definitely does not add value is when you have non-technical middle management that does not understand what is being built and has, <laughs> like our friend Homer here, some very specific ideas on what we should be building that actually, yeah, that's, that's a crazy idea. That's not the way the world works. Oh, and, this entire, there's entire feature sets in shipped software comes from these people. Oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And you know, you should know that the, I wanted to actually have an image of Homer kind of passed out for this, but the uh, friend of mine who is actually working for a no-op right now, he's working on that, um, said actually, you know what, that is implying, if, if he did that little work, that would be awesome. Because then we just, he would just not do any work, that'd be fine. But actually, no-ops often do active harm because they don't understand what they're doing um, and they are trying to help it's the opposite of help. Brian, Brian, this Friday we need a two-hour meeting to go over team structure. I don't think it's right. <laughs> exactly. Or I want to know the, hey, and, and you know, you guys have got this, uh, this milestone in nine months. What percentage of you do you think is going to be, what percentage of this is going to be you? What percentage of this is going to be Bob? It's is like, this an 18% effort? It, it, it's a, I, I, don't, I don't know. We, we, this is so far away. We don't actually, we're not there yet. Well, I need to actually kind of put a number into my Microsoft program so he can tell me. They, 
It's like, but the, the plan that you have based on that is meaningless. It's like, I just need a number. Yeah, but if I, if I don't do it, I don't get my bonus. Th th that's exactly it. And yeah. so the, the, the no-op, I think it can be really toxic. And the, the, the no-op, to me anyway, is a consequence of having non-engineers in engineering management roles. Um, like we actually, I know a story where, this is going to sound sad, but where the... The guy like died and then wasn't replaced. I, no I, listen, I have, no a, one, I have a, an no airtight one, alibi for that. I no actually, one, I was, I was with. No one uh, actually uh, noticed. Oh wait a minute. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, oh, it's yeah. the same sort of thing. We, I mean, we, we know plenty of stories where, a couple cases where they're like, well, you know, the VP of engineering wasn't working out, so we let him go. And it's like nine months later, it's like. Are you even looking for a replacement? And it's like, no. Like, it turned, no. Out, it turned out the guy didn't do anything. The guy didn't do anything. It's like, actually, we got rid of the VP of engineering, and now everyone is really performing oh, so well. Productive. So it's amazing. It's like, oh, that's a serious problem. And that shows, that, that shows how much damage the, the no-op can do. The no-op can, uh, can do a lot of damage to your organization. Oh, the xenophobe. This do you know way. who this is, by the way? It's an old J.D. Salinger. That's who that is. So J.D. Salinger, um, the, the, I, it looks like he's about to bang on a car window here. So yeah, uh, this is this is I, I managed to snap this picture as he was really taking a swing at me. So um, if, if you're a CTO, you've got to be prepared to talk to a lot of people. You need to be. I'm oh, not yeah. saying you need to necessarily be an extrovert, but it should empower you. No, you actually you. have to be an extrovert. You know what? I, that you actually have to be an extrovert. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm wrong. You actually, you, and, and by that I mean, what's the difference between an extrovert and an introvert? You need to actually be empowered by talking to people all day long. You need to get out of a meeting and be like, oh, oh yeah, God, that was a great meeting. <laughs> Those are hard. Right. Uh, if Sorry. You, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool if you don't feel this way, by the way. Not all of us do. Um, Goosebumps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Jason's going to need to go have some private time. But it's, 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 it's not the thing where, about a meeting. You know, but, doing, doing the sort of the shack on the beach and then going away for a month at a time and saying, I'm going to go down and think. Or, or I'm not going to travel. If you're CTO, and I mean, now, I, maybe this is less true in the geo you're in. Um, but or, or what you do. Or, well. or, but if, if you're not co-located next to venture capital, I, this is going to be trouble. Uh, if you're a CTO, you're going to need to travel. Um, you will make yourself ineffective because there, there's just no substitute for a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, and as a CTO, by the way, you also, it's also very important, and this is true for a CEO as well, that you play away games. Uh, and by an away game, I mean you go out and visit your customer, and you visit your customer in, at their site. The reason that's important is because you will get many more uh, descending voices, descending voices in a meeting when you are at your customer than you will when you bring your customer to you. Uh, and actually, a little known story about, or a little known fact about my former CEO, Jonathan Schwartz, who... Um, of Sun. Of Sun. My Little Pony, that one. Uh, MLP, that guy. Yeah. A lot of great things about Jonathan, but, and, sorry Jonathan, this is a being videoed, but this is just a fact. Um, Jonathan is afraid of flying. Afraid. Afraid of dr driving. It's like, you should be in charge of a big, big company if you're afraid of flying. Um, so, um, Jonathan doesn't fly, period. And, like, listen, you're afraid of flying, you're having a seizure right now because I'm bringing back so many bad memories for you, I'm sorry. I, like, I honor your fear of flying. No problem. Lots of us are afraid of flying, I guess. Some of us are, anyway. You just can't run a big company, and you can't be a CTO if you're afraid of flying. If you don't oh, put your ass in the seat... Especially not if you're in San Francisco and you have a tremendous customer base, even in New York. And I mean, you, you, you need to actually be able to go visit the customer, because when you only bring customers to you, you're only bringing your friends to you. And you need to actually go talk to your enemies in the organization. You need to actually watch the body language when you are visiting your customer, and... Having worked for Sun for many years, I saw this a lot, where customers are angry at you, or where there's a, a political divide in the organization. This is the reality of things. Yeah, you don't see the fact they're doing this at the conference room. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right. right. You, like, you don't see the fact that you know, you're over a conference room, you've got no idea, they're playing buzzword bingo on you, dude. Oh, yeah. It's like, you know, they cheered when you talked about your roadmap, that's because you just said the word roadmap and you bingoed this guy. Exactly. Um, exactly. So you, you, you need to have that that face to face. And as a CTO, if, if you are the kind of person, it's like, you know, I actually really don't like to do that. I've got a family at home. I don't like to travel. That's great. That's fine. Just don't be the CTO. Be the VP of engineering um, or, uh, or, or, see, or find I mean, a different role. Well, that's true. I mean, I, I did. I traveled 200 days of last year, 300,000 miles, 52 cities, 18 countries. Yep. I, get on, I get on some planes and they're like, hey, Jason, you know. 
Sitting in the normal seat. I, I, actually, funny story. Jason travels so frequently that we 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 go to sit down and coming out here, and the, you know they got the screens over there. They're displaying the uh, the movies, yeah. and Jason's like, you know, I, I hate it when these things they they panic. The operating system panics while you're watching yeah. a movie, and then you got to wake up, and and it's it's got it's got blocked on on FS check. And it's like, and then Jason just goes into this nerd rage about anyone who's not running ZFS just offends me to my marrow. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, Jason, this is cool. Like, you're doing this for my benefit, and that's very sweet. Um, and and they, those screens are popping like popcorn. It's, it was amazing. We get like halfway over the Atlantic, and bam, bam, bam. And you're watching all these machines panic. And it's like, all these panic. biased messages come flying by, and then it's like, yeah. brrr, it comes booting up, and it's like, please wait. Most of those, most of those are, most of those Jason's are, like waking me up. Look, look, oh, my God. Panasonic, Panasonic Avionics Company running Red Hat from 2002. That's what most of those are. Oh, it's an embarrassment. Anyway, oh, it's like eating a bowl of vomit. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's disgusting, right? Uh, then, of course, we have the upward manager. Um, you know, this is this is this is this is one of these classic ones where you know you're sitting there in your office as the CTO. And you know the VP of Engineering walks in and says, "Oh, oh, oh! Uh, I need to make you aware of a couple things, okay? You know, and then just starts going through this whole little litany of things. Leaves, come back the next day. Just wanted to add a little more color. Comes back the next day, and then of course, you know, about a week in. Oh no! Oh no! 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 We're, we're standing on this slide until you fully appreciate the danger of managing upwards. So the the and the, this is by the way a very common failure mode for uh, for, very. I mean, for for many executives, not just VPs of engineering, but I've seen it up front myself. Just too political. Um, and not, I haven't had this per, this particular animal's view, but I've seen those who have had the view. When you, when you manage up, when you spend your time managing up, first of all, you become disconnected from reality. You, uh, well, this dog can't even see. <laughs> it, and and it, it becomes easy to forget when you hang out with your boss too much. It, um, who wants you just to deliver as much software as fast as you can. It's easy to forget the law of physics of software. And this is a, a very common thing. The law of physics of software is that you have schedule, quality, and features, and you can only pick two of those three. You may not pick all three. You may not have schedule, quality, and features. If you want me to do features, that's cool. Do you want it to be garbage? Oh, no, you don't. Of course. No, that's fine. Then we're going to be flexible on schedule. And if you insist, what well, the problem is, you've got this guy's view for too long, and you begin so to much, make commitments so that you actually can't honor. <laughs> because you begin to say, oh, yes, of course, we'll deliver that, of course, will be high quality on this date. No, you've, been, you've got this guy's view for a little too long, and you've lost track of the fact that of schedule quality and features, you may only pick two. Well, and, I, and, two. I, and, and I find, because I find how... I, I find it really funny how casually the term death march is used. We just got to do a death march. And it's like, you know, death march, a real death march, people, they die. I mean, that's, that's, that's I mean, you're going to march us to death. I mean, that's, that's, that's what a death march is. I don't want to die. Yeah, I mean, it I mean, is actually kind of amazing how that, 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 that's, I mean, it's like, like as if we, we toss around, like, you know, oh, God, like, that, that organization got polio. They got it's polio? Like, no, 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 I'm using that as a metaphor. Right. Well, it's no, like, it's, it's like Lord. calling an engineering pin a concentration camp. I mean, it, it doesn't feel good. None of those terms feel good. No, yeah, and, the, and, and the reason you, you get on a death march is because you have made the, this jackass has made the commitment, you did not make this commitment, this guy made the commitment to, to commit a certain feature set at a certain date and it's now not of the right quality. And now everyone wants a magician. And guess what? You get to work long hours. Uh, and the, the reason you got into this whole goddamn mess is because you had somebody who was focusing way too much time managing up and satisfying the people they work for instead of doing what they need to do, which is deliver high quality product. That is what's incumbent upon us. And of course, as quickly as possible, or with focus. I'm not saying that you, that you should just lazily deliver software. But if you want to deliver high quality software, the way you do that is by being very cautious about that schedule versus feature balance. The, the other fun CTO anti-pattern is that the creator, meaning no matter what anyone in the organization comes up with, every time you see that CTO talking to the press, he's the creator of it. 
He did it. But you, you, this is where you see a lot of first person singular from the CTO. CTO should really not use the first person singular. I was a 1200 person, you know, engineering organization. It's like, well, I was thinking you know. about this and I thought that I could, it's like, you know, you don't think about any of this stuff, man. You are not, the, you, this, is not this is not you. This is some other dude. This is not you. Ah, oh, the cat herder. Um, yeah, we, by the way, we have like three minutes. We have three minutes. So we yeah, we're, we're good. We, got, we only have two more slides. But the, I, my, my, my biggest objection to this is VP of engineers that call themselves cat herders. You know, actually, you actually hear them saying that. It's like, it's like who, 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 who wants to be a cat that's herded by you? I mean... It, it, engineers are not cats, and someone who calls himself a, a, someone, a cat herder probably doesn't know how to lead and motivate people, and is probably not actually the right engineer for the job. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the exemplar engineer. It's not the exemplar. It, the, an exemplar does not need to herd cats. Okay, does anyone know who this is? That's the Bill Joy. Hey, yeah, quite Oh, you. sorry. You're not in the audience. So, uh, this, is, uh, this is Bill Joy. The creator of Java. The creator of Java. So, uh, Bill falls into what we call the uh, the Space Ranger anti pattern. Um, and you know, engineers over um, over their career, um, the, the the purpose of an engineer is to balance what is possible, what has not been done, um, with what can be done, right? And it, it's that balance between the has not yet been done and what is actually possible by the constraints that balances the nature of engineering. Yep. And some of us lose track of that balance. They lose their tethering to the planet Earth and they achieve a certain escape velocity and head out to the Oort cloud. And then the next thing you know, they're writing articles in Wired, say, about how a robot uprising is going to torture us all and enslave us. True. And the next thing That's you true. know, you're talking your mother's book club off the goddamn roof because if the CTO said it, it must be true. Absolutely. Mom, Father. he's a space ranger. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That, that was very therapeutic for me, yeah. so thank you very much. Sir. You feel better? You feel better? Uh, yeah, we know we got it. It's good to know you have an opinion. Yeah, the, the future, by the way, Joy, the future does need us. Turns out you're wrong. And the other one, of course, is. Ah, the naysayer. This is the VP of engineering version of the critic on the CTO, you know, where you literally come and you say, you know, I really, you know, we really should, we really should do this. No. Well, what about, like, this feature? No. But do you think so and so could maybe work on that? Nope. Nope. Okay, do we so have the company you, again? Why does it feel like we work for enemies? I don't know. <laughs> not, not even that. It gets to the point where you know the default is no so much that you begin to actually start wondering as the CTO working with that VP of engineering say, like, what the f do you people do? Like, and, apparently nothing because we're not doing anything new. It's no to everything. And so, you know, it, 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 when you're an engineering leader, it is incumbent upon you to protect your folks, and you don't want them to be tapped arbitrarily, but you can err on the side of telling everyone to go after themselves all the time. Um, and when you do that, you, you lose trust with your organization. Um, I, I want to go back to my middle finger. You don't I'm keeping us on time. All right, look at you. Um, wow, that's, normally that's my role to keep us on time. Um, well, you know. The, but it, it, so it's very important that you know um, what to say yes to, that you're not saying no to everything. Because the, or the organization, we, you are actually working for one company, and you need your VP of engineering to be, to be optimistic enough to be able to help out enough to not be telling everyone uh, no all but the time. to not be so optimistic that he's a space ranger. You, exactly. Do not fall into the space ranger trap. And that said, thank you, everyone. Thank you.